So welcome again to another uh, Ozarks Voices Oral History Interview. My name is Tom Peters. I'm the Dean of Library Services. Today's date is uh, Tuesday, August 8th of 2017, and our guest today is the incomparable Dale Of course, Freese. of course. <laughs> Dale, welcome. <laughs> I, I think I'm happy to be here, Tom. Okay. Uh, we're in his home office here in uh, uh, Greater Springfield. Uh, so, are you from Mansfield? Yes, I I was born there. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I left, uh, no, I was born in Springfield. Oh, really? Thank you. Yeah. At St. John's or? Uh... At Old St. John's on the north side. Okay. On, on North Main Avenue. Yeah. Uh, my mother uh, came up here on the train uh-huh. and stayed. To have in, you? To have me. Had a, a stayed a, a month in an uh-huh. apartment. Wow. <laughs> The, uh, uh, but I grew up in Mansfield. I, I did leave when I was 16, though. Really? Uh-huh. Where'd you go? I, w- I came up here and worked a summer, and then I went to university in Columbia. Uh-huh. Then I went into the Navy. So wait, you graduated from high school when you were 16 years old? Uh-huh. Were you like a super gifted child? <laughs> no, no. I'd like I'd like to claim that, but no. It was a small high school. <laughs> I, I graduated with 27. Wow. Uh, so you was... graduated at 16. You came up here, worked for three months. Yes. Uh-huh. Now, I read somewhere that that job was as the uh, overnight police reporter. Well... No, I was not a police reporter. I was a general assignment reporter. The police reporter later became our staff cartoonist, Scott Shadburn. This this was there's a, a clear career path. There, right? This this was this was during World War Two, you know, and uh, you did a little bit of everything. You you took old bits. You you yeah. you. Uh, I I know on uh, I covered uh, sports. Uh, the amateur baseball team on Sunday afternoons <laughs> and then became police reporter that night on Sunday night. Yeah. Uh, I know we had a fire downtown that just scared me to death because I didn't have my box office completed, you know, <laughs> you had to type it out. <laughs> so what year was this that you spent? Uh, you spent just three months doing yes, this? Yes, uh-huh. The, the managing editor told me that... Uh, I shouldn't go on to school <laughs> that he could teach me uh-huh. uh, much more. What year was this? That you uh, this was 1944. 1944. So the war was still going. Yeah. In fact, I was here during v, uh, during uh, D-Day. Really? Uh, on the paper. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And uh, the front page had already been set. You know, yeah. it was almost stereotyped. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, was, I was there during D-Day. Yeah. Uh, and did a... A sidebar that was uh, rapidly rewritten by one of the <laughs> one of the pros. <laughs> but you yeah. just learned. You started to learn newspaper ship. Newspaper ship, if that's a word. Uh, newspapering. Newspapering. Yes. Okay, it sounds like wallpapering. But <laughs> right. <laughs> it was. <laughs> it was. Uh, just right out of high school. Boom. Well, no, I learned before high school. Uh-huh. I I grew up, uh, and I was a printer's devil for a while on the Mansfield Mirror, and it was uh, run by the Waters family. Ralph Waters was a J school graduate in Columbia, in mm-hmm. Missouri. Uh-huh. And so from about the age of eight, that's what I wanted to do. So, so you knew early on that this was your calling? Yeah. Your well, profession. I don't know if it was my calling. I, I wasn't <laughs> going to become a preacher or anything like that. I uh you can be on a calling to just about anything. Yeah, you know? I guess you can. <laughs> I, no, I, I wanted to be. I was not. Um, I, I guess I could have survived if I had not done it. But, I, but you loved it. You, I, you yeah. Enjoyed it. I, I tell you, I, I used to say that uh, I loved it uh, three quarters of the time, and I hated it a quarter <laughs> of the time, and three out of four ain't bad. <laughs> So on the typical five-day work week, there's about a day and a quarter that you just couldn't stand the job. We didn't have a five-day work week. <laughs> In fact, uh, up until the 70s, it was all six day. Yeah. And uh, and after I became editor, it was it was, it was yeah it was 14 days. I call those a reestab job where you just dial it up and dial it down. You know. Yeah. Uh, 
it's always gone. But um, and we had uh, here after I came back here after I got out of school and the Navy, uh, and thank goodness for the GI Bill because I had uh, three uh, three years on the GI Bill and. When I graduated, I had 13 days left. <laughs> so I use it to its full extent, and I love the GI Bill. I, I wish, I don't know, I don't think we have a similar thing. Uh, no, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Um, but we got, we got a, a check, all of our books, all of our tuition, and uh, $60 a month then. Which could, which could go a ways back then, right? Yeah, it yeah. would because, uh, you know, yeah. it was, uh, it was uh, Suds money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, back to Mansfield for a minute, a couple questions. So you mentioned you were a printer's devil? Yes, uh -huh, that's the lowest on the scale of any. What is a any, printer's devil? A printer's devil does anything that the uh, editor of the country editor doesn't want to do. <laughs> and no, you just swept out, you... Uh, melted metal, you uh, uh, ran handbills on the old presses, uh, yeah. you uh, caught the papers as they came down off of the Miller flatbed press. So uh, you were kind of a gopher, just whatever. That was it. Yeah. That was it. And you were in high school or before high school? Uh, no, this was high school. Okay. So was your, when, would, when did the paper come out? Morning or e afternoon, evening? Oh, on the, uh, I'm talking about the weekly. Oh, it was a weekly newspaper. Yeah, the weekly. It was. Okay. It came out on Thursday mornings. Yeah. Well, Wednesday night, midnight, yeah. whenever you know. But then, when I was in high school, I, I was writing school news uh -huh. for them, and sometimes Saturdays I would fill in as a devil. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and then Mansfield is the home of a uh, longtime home of Laura Ingalls Wilder. Yeah. Uh huh. Did you ever meet her? Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in fact, I sold magazines to her. Really? Uh huh. Go up to her door? Uh, well, I uh, rode a bike to her door uh -huh. because she lived out in yeah. top to us. It was out in the country. Yeah, uh, a mile east of Toronto. And I, I was, I was uh, Gene Cody, who's the yeah. chairman there, and my cousin. By the, uh, they, uh, I said that I rode my bike out to the Wilder home, and she said, no, you didn't. And she she didn't live there then. And I said, yeah, I think I did, Gene. No, your mother wouldn't have let you. <laughs> <laughs> so I was about eight years old. Yeah. Uh, but I, I do remember, this was during the deepest, darkest depression. And, and one thing about it that made them stand out, in my mind, they paid. <laughs> and, which was rather unusual during the on depression. Time. On time. Yeah. Uh, of course, I, my brother had the best route. He had the Saturday Evening Post and Life. And uh, I had Collier's and the, I think it was the uh, Country Gentleman. Yeah. It, it could have been. Well, I had two, and he had two. So you'd go around door to door selling these magazines. Usually had them by. You knew who your customers were, yeah. and also those who paid. And then would you collect the money too? Yes, you yeah. did. Uh -huh. I remember back when I was growing up in the '60s in Iowa, if you were a newspaper boy, you'd deliver the papers, and then like once a week you'd go around and collect the money, and, and then you have like a little receipt. It was just about as big as a postage because, stamp. Uh, the newspaper boys seldom worked for the paper. Yeah. You know, they independent businessmen. Yeah. And the publishers loved that because they yeah. didn't, you know, <laughs> particularly on the collection. It was collection. the same deal. You were just, you were like a, I don't know what you call it, a stringer for the... Uh, <laughs> for, for, for Colliers. Yeah. For, yeah. You were just out there, an independent contractor for Colliers, <laughs> selling those things and collecting the money. And I also, uh, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch that I didn't have to deliver, uh -huh. uh, but I sold 12 subscriptions. I didn't. My uh, The salesman who worked for my dad sold about half of them for yeah. me. <laughs> but I got a new bicycle. Wow. Oh, I did. 12 subscriptions to PD. Wow. But, uh, no, I, I I used to get up at, in summers. I'd slip on our side porch and I'd 
uh, get up at five o'clock and and I'd get the post dispatch or maybe the commercial appeal because they came in on the trains there uh-huh. uh, at Memphis. Uh, yeah. But I read the Globe Democrat, the old St. Louis Star Times, Kansas City Journal Post, the yeah. Kansas City Star, all of those. They all came here. From, right? When I was just, you know, yeah. barely able yeah. left to read. <laughs> So I guess, uh, and then one Christmas I had my own little printing press of the rubber type and all that stuff Yeah. that I had a circulation of about three. <laughs> your mom, your dad. <laughs> Aunts, uncles. <laughs> so what'd you call your publication? Did that have a name? I, I probably did. And uh, I, I don't think that I would have, that would have been engraved for posterity <laughs> in any way at all. I, uh, in fact, I was, I was the only one who didn't go into the banking business in my whole family. Yeah. Um, so my, Gene Cody is a relative of yours? The Cody's? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, my cousin, Joe Cody, we live next door to each other and his mother was my aunt uh-huh. and, uh, so it was the Freeman family, uh-huh. and my great grandpa founded the bank in 1892, and it's still in the family. Yep. So the Cody family, uh, the bank has changed its name. I forget what it's called. Home Pride. Uh, Home Pride Bank. Um, I was on the board then, and I really was in favor of it. I hate to see the Bank of Mansfield go down. <laughs> yeah. They got several branches now, don't they? And yeah, we do have. Uh, yeah. Okay. And it's doing quite well. And I'm still on the board. <laughs> okay. Uh, so then you, you got your yacht, uh, came to Springfield and worked for a few months. Then you went to Mizzou? Yes, I did and, and got one year in. Uh-huh. Uh, of course, J School was a, uh, I had to get two, two uh, uh, 60 hours in arts and letters or arts and science, they called it then. Right. And all kinds of requirements, 15 hours is languages uh, uh, had to have a physical science and a, a general science yeah. uh, core courses and uh, 12 hours of, of English also yeah the 15 hours of uh, foreign languages so that discouraged a lot of pre-journalists <laughs> <I'll tell you. laughs> so what'd you study for a foreign language? Spanish all right Espanol si all right, all right. <laughs> Okay. I can still I can still read it, but speak it I never could <laughs> not well nor under you know when somebody's they're too fast for me. Yeah. Uh, so the the year you were there was forty five forty six. Yeah, uh, 40, uh, 44, 45. Okay. Uh, and I played basketball. Did you? Yeah. Power forward. No, I was a <laughs> point guard. Really? Yeah. Uh-huh. Well. Back then, the, the guards and the forwards are interchangeable. So, right. the uh, thing, but uh, did you pay, play for a varsity team? Or huh? Did you play for the varsity? Yeah. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Really? Yeah, Leonard. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Remember what your uh, points per game average was? Or I can only remember <laughs> what my highest score was, and it was fourteen points. All right. Yeah. That's probably during a time where you know they didn't score that much. Uh, no, we, if, if you, I know the percentages uh, that if you shot 30%, uh, you know, it it was okay. Uh, but a lot of, I know when I was in high school, there would be a lot of 20 point games, like 22 to 18, stuff like that. Uh, No three pointer back then. Oh no. Huh? And a four, four fouls and out. Oh really? I found out the long, hard way. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> all the time. Really? You fell out a lot? In high school, I did. Did you? <laughs> I, in, uh, in college, I think I only fouled out once because, uh, primarily because I didn't play that long. <laughs> you know? you I, did, did you start? I, or did I you? started after, uh, after our point guard uh, graduated at the end of uh, the first semester. The first uh-huh. semester uh-huh. Uh, I started. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so was this the old uh, Big Eight? Was, was Big the... Six at that time? Okay. We had uh, we had not added Colorado or A and M or or uh, Oklahoma. So uh, Iowa State was it? Were they Iowa State KU? and uh, KU, K State, Oklahoma, and Missouri, and Nebraska. Yeah. And I 
our season, I think, was uh, 500. Yeah. The, my freshman year. When I came back after the Navy, uh, they changed coaches, and I changed attitudes. <laughs> I I I learned a lot of things that I shouldn't have. <laughs> and a lot of and a lot of uh, men had come back from the service. Too. Oh God! I think we had third. If I'm not mistaken, and this did not count the the in resident ones, but I think we had thirteen Letterman returning. Yeah. So, as Sparky Stock up uh, the old, I think it, he coached at Kirksville or Maryville before that. He had been hired, uh, and Sparky and I uh, <laughs> had had a few. Uh, problems, and, and the uh, ironic part it was that uh, my senior year in J school, I covered the Tigers okay. and the Sparky. <laughs> Were you fair? And as a journalist, I think that? so. God, I overrode. I know that it was, it, it was not. It was not my finest hours. Okay. Uh, so you went into the Navy. Spent three years in the Navy. No, huh? I was only in uh, about eighteen months. Uh-huh. And I, but I, I got three years of, uh, of GI Bill out of it. Okay. Where'd you serve? I, <laughs> well, in Great Lakes, uh, yeah. naturally, yeah. Uh, in, in Boots. Then I went to uh, an advanced base personnel depot getting ready to ship out to go to Japan. Yeah. Uh, or before the war was over. And yeah. uh, then... Uh, the war ended yeah. while I was on the West Coast. And I always said that I, I saved San Francisco from the Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> they didn't invade it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, then the, uh, the base newspaper had an opening uh, for an assistant editor. Mm -hmm. And I had all this tremendous experience one year in Springfield and, right. and one year in college and uh, in the Mansfield Mirror. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they took me on. And so I was uh, the editor of the San, the San Bruno Breezes Advanced Base Personnel Depot, uh -huh. uh, was discharged, and I became editor oh. uh, of that <laughs> paper. Then we decommissioned the, the base, and I uh, got 15 days leave to go to Oakland from San Francisco <laughs> <laughs> and became editor of the Oakland Log at uh, Naval Air Station in Oakland. Really? So that's, that, that was my combat duty. Was being, primarily serving as an editor. Uh-huh. And... And editor and reporter and yeah, small staff. <laughs> I was it. Oh. <laughs> was it a weekly? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. Uh, I had uh, some stringers, you know, who would yeah. uh, who would contribute. Down there, but that was it. No, I was it. Yeah. And I would even go into South San Francisco to the printing plant there, and I had this wonderful thing, what uh, the Navy called a free gangplank that uh, I had a free pass. You could go in. Go in and out. Yeah. Go in and, uh, uh, but it was my, uh, since I had been on the mirror and I knew what a print shop was, you know, I felt right at home and, and I had not been into a union shop though. Uh -huh. And, I remember one time I was looking over some type upside down and touched it and and oh my god I thought I thought that was going to be the end of my career right there they they called what did they call it uh, anyway they just stopped immediately really yeah the whole shop you'd violated something I did yeah yeah huh. <laughs> They, I give you, they give you a stern warning. Uh huh. Uh -huh. They really did. Yeah. And I took it to heart. Uh huh. I sure did. So then you uh, finished with your service. Yeah, my service and you know, got my degree. 
So you came back and got your degree? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I came back in three years and yeah. didn't play basketball. <laughs> yeah. um, so that was about 49 when you graduated? Yes, I did in 49. Okay. Uh -huh. So then what, what did you do then? I hunted for a job. <laughs> uh, you know, we had all these GIs uh, yeah. and, uh, and school then. I thought it was crowded then and we had 15,000 students. Uh, yeah. And... Uh, and it, it was really tough, and the pay was just awful. I, Jobs were scarce. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you, you could hire somebody for nothing almost yeah. uh, in in the newspaper business. Right. It never did pay well for Kinda reporters like at all. <laughs> it, it was awful. I, I know I, uh, I got an offer from Wichita Eagle Beacon, I think it was. One of the, 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 the Wichita had the two papers, and I think it was $36 a week. Uh, yeah, that was it. Uh, Monette Times, I got an offer from them, yeah. uh, and I got one from, oh, what, what's, what's the town right at the uh, Virginia-Tennessee border? Uh, uh, Asheville? No, Asheville's all in North Carolina. Oh, sorry. Yeah. This, no, this, <laughs> it's, uh, any, anyway, uh, they, they wanted me to come just for a tryout, you know. And oh, yeah. The only way I could get there was by train. And, and in the meantime, I uh, got a call from the old sports editor in Springfield and said, where have you been? And I said, I've been looking for a job. He said, I thought you were coming back here. <laughs> and so I, I for, uh, let's see, $52 a week for 48 hours. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, six day a week mm -hmm. for 52 bucks. Yeah. And that, that was it. My, uh, my closest friend, Marty Edelman, who I later talked into coming back as sports editor after I got into a position where I could, uh, he got the best job in our graduating class with the Sporting News in, in mm -hmm. St. Louis. Mm -hmm. uh, and it seems to me it was $70 a week, but split shifts. Mm. And he... He might work for three hours one day and then seven hours one day and 12 hours one yeah. day yeah. on the old sporting news. Yeah, just and he it got out. it by writing J.G. Taylor Spink, who was the publisher at that time, and pointed out three or four typographical errors. <laughs> and he said, if I was on your staff, you wouldn't be having these. And and the old man, the old man said, "Hey, come on." He's got moxie. Yeah, he does him. that. <laughs> uh, well, I got a lot of things I want to talk to you about, but uh, in no particular order. But um, uh, so he started in '49. So it was in '53 that we had the Great Cobra Scare. Yes, uh-huh. And as a newspaper person, how what, what what did you make of that at the time? Did you think it was all just crazy or <laughs> Yeah. Well, we had all of us had an idea what the source was. Yeah, was it an we, office pool or something or what No. <laughs> no. <laughs> it, it was a joke that you know all of us thought thought, thought it was. And did they think it was a scam? Somebody was No, no, uh, -uh no, we we knew it was for sure. The uh I, I guess later on the word would have been the uh, the guy who was responsible for it was a real squirrel. <laughs> he was just a kid, wasn't he? Uh, no, no. Uh -uh. Oh. He, he ran a pet shop. Oh, the owner of the pet shop. The owner of the pet shop. Yeah. And you could walk into his pet shop and there'd, there'd be a macaw or a parrot walking on the, on, you know, in the pet <laughs> shop. But uh, we didn't know this for later. In fact, uh, Jack Anderson, the old uh, uh, columnist, uh, he took for Drew Pearson's uh, job in, in Washington, and the syndicated guys were having a ball with it too. 
you know, where did where did all these cobras come from? <laughs> and, and, and our city manager at the time, uh, Dale K. Wood, even got a panel truck. Yeah, I've seen photos of this. <laughs> and, and put the cobra, cobra <laughs> sound on it, you right. know. Supposed to the draw end, end, co- the, the end, cobra sounds. Yeah, the, the end did sound. We got serum. And they had serum over at Bird's Hospital. Really? Cox now. Really? And then they found out that you had to inject the serum for it to be successful. Before you got bit? No. Oh. With, but it had to in five minutes. Oh, five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it was never used. Uh, <laughs> but they did find, they found a lot more. <laughs> Apparently, the, you know, the, this sack of cobras delivered to him fell off of a delivery truck or something <laughs> like that. And then, then he was afraid to... Uh, Oh, admit. To let everybody know. Admit that he was a culprit. And his pet shop was near that uh, quarry at. Uh, oh, at National. Uh, at National and yeah. and Sun and National and and St. Louis. Yeah. And uh, this, a lot of it's been filled in. Yeah. And everybody thought, oh God, did they probably? They're probably we're probably going to have cobras forever, you know, <laughs> because they'll get into that. But uh, <laughs> none of them ever showed up in the quarry that I'm aware of. Uh-huh. <laughs> but I think it wound up 10 or 11 or 12 yeah. cobras. Yeah. And a picture of Betty, Betty Love took one picture of it. Here's, here's a cobra in, in in the striking mood in an intersection <laughs> downtown, <laughs> you know. <laughs> of course, so, so some of the And we would... Get quotes from the pet shop owner, and he said, "Oh, it's uh, it's uh, normal for people to have snakes in their basement." He said, I, "I've sold a lot of pythons and boas, you know, for people to keep in their basements." <laughs> oh boy, keeps the rats down or something. Oh my. <laughs> uh, so that was '53, and then. Uh... And with our terrible drought, oh God. Oh yeah. Oh, hottest temperature in the world. Uh, yeah. Uh, it was just, uh, I, I know, uh, I, I think it was 54, 55, uh, I talked to Marty Edelman to come back and he was in sports and we played golf out at Grandview, which is now the Stewart mm-hmm. uh, golf course and couldn't understand why there was nobody there. And, uh, we played three holes and then we found out the temperature was 113. <laughs> uh, we were paired to a uh, refreshment parlor. <laughs> then, to wait out. On the way out. <laughs> we only played three holes. Yeah. But then you, you could top a ball and it'd go 350 yards. <laughs> yeah. You really would. So it dry. Was awful. It, was, it was terrible. Slick greens, huh? And we had uh, the Chamber of Commerce hired somebody to seed the the right. uh, the clouds. Not do anything. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. Um. So I'm I've got a keen interest in the Ozark Jubilee. So from '55 to '60 were the Jubilee years. Um. Again, as a newspaper man, what do you <coughs> make of that? Uh, did you ever go to the show? Oh yeah, uh, mm-hmm. not often, but yeah. uh, you know it was. I. A lot of, I was going to call if you can consider Springfield to be sophisticates and I never did but 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 a lot of them uh, uh, didn't they looked askance at some of them at yeah. the, the Jubilee the yeah. the upper crust people did and till they, music till, till they found out that it was successful and <laughs> then but it was uh, I I think uh, I think it was good for Springfield I for the first three or four, or maybe six months, uh, they filmed it in Columbia. Yeah. Uh, because of the what the coaxial cable or yeah, something. Yeah, they couldn't like. upload a network signal. Yeah, they couldn't get the network signal. Yeah. And uh, so then then it came down here and they uh, uh, had it at the uh, tower, not the tower, but the uh, jewel. Jewel. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. And then later, when when they changed the name, I, I was, I had gone. In fact, I'd gone to Washington uh -huh. uh, by then, so I, I missed out on some of that. When I came back, I think they'd already moved in into the Landers. Yeah, Landers uh, is a five-star jubilee. It didn't last very long. No, I don't think it did. I a that one was that around nineteen sixty. Nineteen sixty, believe. Yeah. Yeah. Sixty-one. Well, I, I, I would, I would in Washington from fifty-six to uh, fifty-nine. Oh, okay. Uh, but you did go to the Jubilee early on? Don't yeah, you and then and then the guy that I worked for and later became a congressman, Charlie Brown, yeah. he he did a uh, a summer show. Uh, what what do they call those summer replacements? Yeah, so it was, summer uh, replacement. Yeah, I guess that was it. Anyway, uh, starring Eddie Arnold, and uh, so uh, he he. Uh, this Charlie Brown had had managed uh, uh, KYTV uh -huh. uh, at the time, and he resigned from that to be to produce the Arnold Show uh -huh. uh, one summer, uh -huh. and so I, I I was around that show because surreptitiously I'd been helping Charlie. Uh -huh. I wasn't supposed to. I was an assistant city editor, and I was... You're not supposed to get involved uh, in politics. No, yeah. not at all. Yeah. But, but, that, but I, I got to know a lot of those people, and, and particularly the publicist, uh, uh, Don uh, Richardson. Don Richardson, yeah. And uh, who later uh, became the uh, Hershen favorites. Yeah, until he, he, he put the silver in Silver Dollar City. Until he uh, drank himself out of it, and yeah. drugged himself out of it. Yeah. But he was hail fellow well met boy. He was something else. Was he? Yeah, and he he wrote the if you could call it that he he wrote a lot of the jubilee. But it was that that stuff that then read. Yeah. Uh, but I I met a lot of the performers on the campaign trail. Yeah. After I came back yeah. uh, on the, and was working the campaign in the summers and uh, politically, the then a uh, a New York columnist uh, named Earl Wilson. I don't know if uh, he was a syndicated columnist. Yeah. He he did one of those dot 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 things. Uh, you know, celebrities and all that right. stuff. Right. He. He came back and spent about a week in, in Springfield mm -hmm. and, and loved it and, and gave it some good publicity. Uh -huh. uh, the, uh, I think, I think the Jubilee when, when Charlie did the Eddie Arnold show was uh, on hiatus or whatever they call it. I don't think, mm -hmm. but that doesn't sound right. You know, as far as I know, they, uh, I don't think they ever took a break. They did it all. They did yeah, every, every, this the, well, week. this was the summer of fifty six. Hmm. Well, they weren't now. I don't know, but for sure. But you know, but, but they could have done both. They, of they would have gone. They would have. You know, but some, they a lot could. of those performers would have done multiple shows. Oh yeah, they, they did. Uh, and in fact, I, a lot of those guys would appear on the uh, uh, on the Eddie Arnold show, and then he yeah. would bring in. Guys like Bond Monroe and right. and uh, some of the, the female singers and yeah uh, Kitty Wells yeah I think that she was here several times Norma Jean I'm Norma sure. Jean of course the old Carter family you know they were yeah somehow they came down from the Lake of the Ozarks or <laughs> some of them did anyway but well they were living in Springfield for a while yeah Mother yeah. Maybell and uh, the three but I I remember when. Uh, Red, Red Foley, uh, home was over in uh, Brentwood, the old Brentwood uh -huh. part of town, uh -huh. and uh, I drove by there one time, and Red, Red and Pat Boone were out playing catch, throwing the football or <laughs> baseball. I, you, I think it was a softball, but it could have been a football. It was uh, the uh, Red. Then Red appeared. Uh, at a campaign rally for Charlie one time. And, really? Uh, Do you remember where that was? Yeah, in Carthage. Or they call it, in Springfield, they call it Carthage. No, Carthage. <laughs> uh, 
And it didn't turn out too well. What, what happened? Well, he, he was sober okay. there, but somehow he got a fifth of vodka and between Springfield, I mean, to Carthage and Springfield, he just, mm. he drank it all. Wow. And Coming back? Yeah. Oh. He, <laughs> the, uh, the main vocalist, a guy named Tommy Sosby, who also was an alcoholic, mm. he, uh, I was standing, as Red was singing, God walks these hills. <laughs> you know? Oh, oh God. It, and, and it came to one of the notes and, and Tommy turned to me and he said, I told you that SOB couldn't hit that high note. <laughs> one performer to the next. I learned a whole lot about that. But Red came to see us in Washington and by God, they had them lined up just People wanting his autograph. Really? I I took him to lunch in the uh, in the Senate dining room. Really? And you had lunch with Red Foley in the Senate dining yeah, room. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> I'll be I'll be imagining that for the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, how'd that and, go? Huh? How'd that go? <laughs> Red could barely eat uh, because of people coming. Uh, really? And and the, the black people just loved him. They really did. Uh, huh. Of course, all, every waiter in the Senate dining room was black. Yeah. Uh, the uh, I, I, I do remember one thing. He, he had, uh, of course, we had the natural, we had the beans and the cornbread, yeah. you know, the yeah. traditional thing. Yeah. But he had a side of spinach. Uh -huh. <laughs> and he said, after, after we ate, he said, You'll have to excuse me because the spinach is really acting on me. <laughs> so I had to excuse him. I, I, I don't know what restroom he went in. It could, could have been the speaker of the house. And if you, but no, they loved him there. They really did. And he, he did give me one confidential thing. He sort of whispered it to me. He was being taking the task with the IRS yeah, at that time. Yeah, this was when he was having his, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and he said, Dale, he said, you know, they can't understand why I had 14 checking accounts. <laughs> and he said, he said, I wasn't hiding it from the government. I was hiding it from Sally. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, like that was back in the day when you get a free toaster or something if you open a checking account. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Red had them all over the country. his by it with your checking account. But no, he took he took it's like Eddie Arnold. He came in and I took Eddie to lunch, but not over there. Yeah. He, uh, so you worked in D.C. for uh, about three years. Yeah. yeah. What were you doing there? I was an administrative assistant to the congressman. So what, what does that entail? What did that entail? You run the office and you were, you were you printer's the devil office, again. you did the research. You were printer's devil again, just a different... Right. <laughs> I hired the hat, hired the people to work in the office. And what was that What was that like? Were those heady times? For yeah, they, they were. I I, uh, I got a kick out of it. In fact, I was going to stay on uh, and, and work in Symington's office. And, and that, that was... <laughs> It, well, it was a better job, not as an AA, but not as an administrative assistant, but as maybe third yeah. down the line. And it was, uh, the seniority was, you know, you, you could stay in a, in a Senate's job. Yeah. Congressman's job, you campaigned from the day you got elected. <laughs> right. uh, met a lot of nice people. We had an organization of administrative assistants, Democratic administrative assistants, and it was called the Burroughs Club. The Burroughs? Burroughs? The Burroughs. Oh, okay. The Burroughs, the donkeys. Right, right. And we met at the Library of Congress, damnedest speakers you've ever seen. You could just holler. Oh, we had Jack Kennedy twice. We had Dean Acheson. We had yeah. all these guys. And they'd come over you know, and... We 
we didn't have a president of the Burroughs Club. We had five, five vice presidents. <laughs> so that, we figured that was the political thing to do. <laughs> but those people come over just like, you know, somebody come talk to Rotary Club here or something. Oh, they yeah. Just, like, they just, yeah, yeah. You just come, zip over Oh, they'd there. be, you know, say, give, give us a, a heads up, you know, and... Uh, <laughs> It, it was nice. Uh, so you're, you did you ever meet Jack Kennedy? Oh yes, many yeah. times. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, he spoke to the Burroughs Club a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. what, what was he like in in, uh, in Oh it, well, he was a senator then. Right. And uh, I I remember what his AA told me one time at a Burroughs meet. He said, you know, that son Buck, he's breaking me. He said he never has any money waving. We'll go out for something, get in a cab, and he'll say, it, it, if you got any money, we didn't pay the cab. You know, that, that was it. But I, I had to understand that later on that a lot of the rich people like that and didn't never think about money. They just uh, didn't bother carrying it, huh? Yeah. Well, I guess not. Or they yeah. say they don't. Yeah. I, I, no, the, uh, uh, the Roosevelt uh, uh, FDR Jr. I know, and all the uh, Hubert Humphrey, yeah. those guys. Yeah. He was my favorite. Hubert was. Oh yeah. God. From Minnesota. God, I think he's the sharpest man I ever really was ever around in my life. Really, in your yeah. entire life, he was the sharpest. Yeah. Huh? He just had a grasp of things, and yeah, I, I, I. I I was sitting on some of the committee meetings if Charlie Brown could not be there or he might be out campaigning or something. Right. And the Agriculture Committee and the uh, Secretary of Agriculture was a guy named Ezra Taft Benson. Uh, he was a Mormon mm -hmm. uh, from uh, Salt Lake City. Mm -hmm. And he was testifying something and, and uh, Humphrey was on, on the... I don't think he was chairman, but he was on the committee, the, the Senate Agricultural Committee. And uh, and he said, excuse me, Mr. Secretary, didn't you say back, he gave the date like November the 18th of 1960-whatever, right. such and such and such and such? And uh, the secretary said, no, Senator, I don't believe I did. And he called to his administrative assistant, Humphrey Dent, and he came over and he said, on page such and such, you said... Of the congressional record? Of congressional record. Yeah. You said such and such. Uh -huh. And Hubert was right, but he remembered. Yeah. He was something else. So, uh, why'd you leave D.C.? I, uh, I, I was... I was a little bit upset at uh, campaigning. I didn't like that at all. Kind of leave a bad taste in your mouth? Yeah, I did. Uh, even though I, uh, Charlie Brown became a lifelong friend, and we, his brother and I uh, became lifelong friends and still respected him and everything. And then my wife didn't like Boston at all. Yeah. So I... Just didn't uh, like the whole atmosphere, or a little bit, but she didn't like the uh, living. We had to have apartments there, an apartment here. Yeah, didn't like that part of it. Yeah, uh, she uh, didn't like uh, certain camp. She didn't like campaigning at all. Yeah, yeah. and uh, so I uh, decided. After three years, I had looked for a newspaper job, and I was, Gannett had a, a, I think they had two or three people in our Washington office. Gannett was not what it is now. Yeah. Uh, but I, I didn't, I, I talked to the guys, and, uh, but I, uh, it would have been staying there in Washington with the same thing. Yeah. So then I got an offer from the Commercial Appeal in, in Memphis, uh -huh. came back there, 
and it was a, a night job forever. Yeah. And was you actually went to Memphis? Huh? You went to Memphis? No. Oh. I, oh, you yeah. just interviewed for it? I, yeah, stayed at, they put me up great, just stayed at the Peabody Hotel. Yeah. I, my salary, as an administrative assistant, of course, the congressman only made twenty two five at the time. You got the liberal account. I think, and I was about the highest paid civil service, and it was thirteen five, hmm. And I had the two homes. In 59? Yeah. Yeah. 58, 50, yeah. 59. Yeah. Uh, and when the, the people at Commercial Appeal, they said, well, what were you making? And I said, I was making 13 five. They said, oh, we couldn't pay that. Can't match that. Yeah. Mm -mm. So what'd you do? Did you come back to Springfield? I got a call and from a guy, a photo engraver, who was a, a good friend of mine. I always found out you make friends with the people in the shop too, uh -huh. Uh -huh. for sure. And he said, they thought you were gonna come back to Springfield. Well, <laughs> so it's, it's deja vu time. all over again. <laughs> when I are said, you coming back? <laughs> yeah. So I came back here and they did some Moving around, and I became a Sunday editor, features editor. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and what did that entail? I don't, I don't know the news day. Uh, just features, and, and I kind of human interest stuff. Uh, yeah, all of it. It's Sunday, and I, I did some writing too. Wrote yeah. a column, uh, and I also. At the same time that I was features editor, I was an assistant city editor. Mm -hmm. And all at once, the city <clears throat> editor quit. Mm -hmm. uh, he made the terrible mistake of asking the publisher for a raise. <laughs> and the publisher said no, and, and Perry Smith said, then I'm leaving, and he <laughs> said goodbye. <laughs> so I took his job, and. Then became executive city editor for the day side, night side, then managing editor yeah. in uh, 65, around there, yeah. something like that. It was kind of rapid. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, okay, one, 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 before we get too far away from the Ozark Jubilee, yeah. did you ever meet like uh, Cy Simon? And oh, Ralph Cy Foster? and I were good friends. Really? And we later served on a, what was the committee? Uh, anyway, it, it was uh, attached to the school of the Ozarks, and it was uh, we named the uh, uh, Missouri the uh, something of the year. We yeah. picked uh, people like that, oh, yeah. and uh, Cy was chairman of that uh -huh. with Ralph Foster, uh -huh. and Ralph, and we had the uh, the ceremonies at the museum and all that stuff. So no, we were good friends. Uh, uh -huh. And what are your memories of Cy? Oh, was he full of energy? Huh? Was he full of energy? Oh yeah, he really was. You would, except you would never know that. Here, here's a guy who was really famous. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. you never know it from Cy uh, at, at all. Uh, he was just a regular person. Oh, he really that. was. In fact, we we had a usually a Christmas thing here and. And Cy and his wife were, oh, you know, they were, they were just nice people. They really were. Mm -hmm. uh, and he had some great hits. Yeah. I at that time, I think that Ralph and Cy and John Mahaffey, uh, they they were they thought that they were going to overtake Nashville. They they believed they were. They believed it. They really, they, they really thought it, and Nashville had other ideas, of course, and and I'm I'm sure even with the performers, I think that that uh, when Red came here, yeah, that he jumped ship, yeah, uh, they th thought that might have been the turning of the tide. No, I it just never, they they could never sustain it. Uh, Ralph Foster, he, he, God, all these performers had. 
performed on his radio shows on yeah. on KWTO. Yeah. Keep watching the Ozarks, right. uh, you know, and right. uh, and and he he was an unusual guy. He really was. I think he grew up in St. Joe or something like that. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, uh, came down here with KGBX or yeah. uh, uh, and and KWTO, uh, but. All, the, all these performers, he, they loved him. They really did. And, mm. Hell, I don't think he paid them anything. <laughs> well, they would go on the road, yeah. you know, and, and, That's do, where they made their money and play these small towns like players. Mansfield and, yeah. and Seymour and all yeah. those. And, yeah. and, uh, did you ever have a KWTO show come out to Mansfield? Oh, yeah. Did you, did you, have, did you attend? Or? Yeah, I did. Uh, did. Did it happen to be Corns or Kraken? Uh, you know, that, you know, I... I can't remember. But it was a big deal if, man, the oh, KWTO stars are coming to Mansfield Saturday oh, night. Oh, yeah. Oh, we had it in the uh, Eagles Hall or whatever yeah. the hell it was. I yeah. don't know that. But it was <laughs> it, the place to be if you were. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, of course, uh, uh, Bill Ring was, yeah. uh, uh, yeah. Bill was talented. Too, he really was. That's that's some great talents, and uh, and a lot of these guys had already performed here when they became stars. So, right, right. yeah. Chet Atkins was here. And... Yeah, Chet, uh, Chet, and uh, he he was uh, well on the Eddie Arnold show all that one summer, yeah. and. Uh, Nice guy, he really yeah. was. Yeah. Uh, Carter sisters were here earlier. Car Carter. Carter sisters, uh, the uh, Porter Wagner. Of course, Porter. Did you ever uh, hear Porter perform? Oh yes, God, on the KWCO, you know, he was still a good old West Plains boy. Yeah. Yeah. What'd you What'd you think of him, boy? What did you, what did you... I thought he was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I take it back, Fort Porter. Uh, uh, he. Of course, he and Dolly, you know, had this great yeah. arrangement. Yeah. He owned half of her, yeah. really owned yeah. everything, but yeah. made a fortune off of it. Yeah. He, he had a long-running show. He had one great quote. I don't know that the, if this is about third hand. He said, if, if, if I can play golf and make love every day, I've got it made. <laughs> <laughs> With his idea of the good life, huh? Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, before we get beyond, so yeah. uh, I know you interviewed Elvis Presley once. Yeah, I did. Uh, and 56? In 56, in fact, it was in November of 56, and I had already taken a job in Washington. <laughs> and I'd already given my notice, and, and that, and even even though the interview was not too popular with a lot of kids in the Ozarks, I think I said that I got 376 letters. Uh, I think it was either 276, but I know it was the most letters that I've yeah, ever received. Really? And, this, and how were they trending? <laughs> oh, this, I'll never forget. I think she was about 14 years old from Marshfield. Dear, I, I was writing it under the name of a column that I had done on Sundays called The Spectator. Yeah. And, and so, were you were anonymous? Nobody knew who The Spectator was? No. Or, uh -uh. You know, yeah. oh, I, you Some know. people might have figured it out. Yeah. But yeah, but. So, Dear Spectator, <laughs> I'd like to cut out your guts and spit on them. <laughs> <laughs> Because you disrespected Elvis? Yeah, but I didn't. I yeah. really didn't. And I you kind of went in with a, uh, uh, you know, a, a journalistic skepticism. About yeah. I, 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 well, one thing, I, I, actually, I did it as a, as a letter or as a note to the city editor at the yeah. time. Yeah. And it, kind of reporting what you'd found. As what I'd found. Yeah. And I had called a guy named Les Arnold, who was a passenger agent at the Frisco, or he had called me and said, Elvis is 
It's in the building. It's in the building, <laughs> right. He's, uh, he's on the sunny land. That was the name of the train. Uh-huh. And he's going to be in Springfield about 2 o'clock. In the afternoon? In the or? afternoon. Uh-huh. And I said... Remember what day of the week it was? I don't. I, I think it was Wednesday or Thursday. Uh, he, he was going to Vegas, I know Just that. Just a weekday. Yeah, yeah, a weekday. And that, I'm working on the afternoon paper. Yeah. He... Uh, but you and, had a tip from... Yeah, and I said, oh, Les, I said, could you do me one huge favor? Could you not tell anybody? Because I'd like the interview him, and I don't want all these screaming kids around. So I, I don't know his career that well, but, but by 56, he was he was attracting, especially young women, oh, who yeah. would just kind of lose it when around him. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, in, in fact, during the interview, uh, he said something about they'd stopped in Mark Tree, Mark Tree, Arkansas. And in fact, my brother in law was station agent down there at one time, <laughs> my first brother in law. And, uh, and I, I forgot what to bring him, but his cousin, who was traveling with him, said, uh, Oh, Tell, tell him about that little old girl down at Mark Tree who gave you the thingy on your shoulder, you know. <laughs> and, <laughs> but, oh, they were hanging on him, and he yeah. was so... Well, I think what precipitated the the bad press <laughs> was that I said something about Elvis Presley is just like any other 21-year-old Ex truck driver from Tupelo with two Cadillacs, a million dollars, <laughs> and something yeah. else. You know, so he was just a regular old boy. Just a regular was, old boy. Made a lot of money. Yeah, and, and, and he was a hell of a nice guy. He really, really was. I I really thought he was, uh, and always. But you had a quiet me. conversation with him. Yeah, uh, we we yeah. were uh, in the. Uh, well, it was half coach and half bar car, yeah. you know, like yeah. that they used to have. Yeah. And we were just sitting there, and he had uh, Billy Jean Smith, his cousin, and I can't think of the other guy's name, traveling with him. Yeah. And they were going to Vegas. Uh, uh, he'd, uh, I, I thought for a while, my memory was that, that he was going to... Uh, Hollywood to make his first movie, but I think yeah. he he might have already made his first movie. Yeah, I don't know. He could fifty six. Yeah. November of fifty six. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm I'm not sure. So you interviewed him now. Uh, I don't want to keep you too long, but I know you worked with a lot of people. But uh, Betty Love was she with you? Yeah, she was with me. She thought he was just tremendous. Just thought she he was, was a tremendous. photographer. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Betty. Uh, no, she she wasn't him. screaming or biting him or anything. Or... <laughs> she couldn't understand why why, why these silly yeah, the, kids. She, were... she had that journalistic skepticism <laughs> yeah. as well. Huh? Well, I you know it was sort of like Elvis. He only had the people on his side, <laughs> but a lot of people just I I guess the. Uh, the word would have been they disrespected him. Yeah. They, uh, particularly those who thought who thought uh, that they were uh, that he was just a hillbilly from Tupelo. Yeah. Uh, and rock and roll, and that and was. Some people thought this was the end of the beginning of the end of civilization. And, oh know, yeah. You know. Well, sort of like the Beatles and Ed Sullivan and all that, you know. And, yeah. And later on, then I'm not sure that he'd appear. I think he'd already appeared on the Ed Sullivan show. And they showed him from the, you know. <laughs> Didn't show his hips? Oh, hell no. <laughs> uh, the, uh, I, uh, but it was a good interview, but, yeah. and 
the ironic part of it was that I left town. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that, the, that was not the reason. <laughs> you didn't wait for the reader response. Huh? <laughs> no, no I, I was there for the reader. I had given my two weeks notice. Oh. <laughs> and uh, That was like your last final memory. Yeah, it was it. <laughs> <laughs> but it did not... This was the afternoon, and I worked on an afternoon paper, and I wasn't about to give it to the night side. That's what we called the daily news, the morning paper, and we were fierce enemies. Uh-huh. No, we we shared staffs and everything, but I wasn't going to give them that story, yeah. and, and didn't. So I. So you felt you had a you know you'd done a real coup. You'd had a quiet conversation with Elvis. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Did the wires pick it up at all? Or? I have no Can't idea. They, it's 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 sort of like, I. Uh, I was stringing for the AP on election night sometimes, and and uh, and I think I got, I, I I would call the county clerks or the editors of the weeklies around here, uh, to get their results, and I think. I promised them all five dollars a night. Is what yeah. they got, yeah. and I think that's about what the AP paid me for all that. It's five dollars. <laughs> five dollars. Yeah. What I never. And then we had. Uh, <laughs> you called when you called somebody, you could just you know you had centrals in, and I I said. Uh, whatever the, the central is called, you know, and I say, uh, get me the Cashville Democrat, yeah. the paper. And the operator says, you mean there's only one? <laughs> <laughs> so as actually, for people who view this, there was a switch, there was a central switchboard for oh, yeah. phone uh-huh. calls. Oh, they had it. it Would route it, the call. They had it at the university. You know, yeah. I think you can still talk to a person when you call a university. Yeah, you can. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um. So, uh, the little I know about Betty Love, I, I find her an interesting person. Um, oh, so Betty Love and Hank Billings. Uh, they would fly around a lot. Evidently. Yeah, the, the, Hank liked to fly. Yeah, Hank. Hank got his license when he was in high school, or just a student's high school. He, Hank took the advice of this editor I was telling you about. The editor said, "I can teach you more than you can learn in J school," and he stayed on. But we broke. Hank started there in a, De- November, December, and I started there in the next May. Oh, uh, so. He, but he, he got his uh, license, and we added uh, a lot of aerial photography, and particularly after I became city editor, uh, uh, and Hank flew Betty a lot of times. He has those old speed graphics. Do you remember yeah. seeing those old yeah. things? And she'd hang out the damn door, you know, <laughs> and shoot at the head and you come around again, Hank, so I can get another shot. Uh, but she was an artist in the dark room and uh, people have no idea now, you know, what even that means. Yeah. But, uh, and she but did. She was really, really good. And pioneered color photography in the newspaper. And I, I can remember the prints that Betty would do were just beautiful. The reproduction in the paper was horrible. <laughs> it was because we didn't have the capabilities of yeah. of, of the offset yeah. then. Yeah. Uh, but I, we tried it. We uh, did she have to convince you to to uh, run color? No, I was the other way around almost. Oh. Yeah. She she was all for it. Some of the photographers didn't like it because it it took a hell of a lot of time and and, yeah. and they they were they were not dark room artists yeah. like but Betty, Betty was. Oh Betty yeah. Was, yeah, she was an artist. Number one, uh, that. Oh, that's right. She was an artist, and then 
she taught art in, yeah. in, in and public they needed, schools. They needed a photographer because of the war, or yeah, she yeah. she uh, she was just kind of a substitute uh, at the paper, but she did some illustrations and. Uh, uh, Betty was graduate of Drury. Real, uh, I, I do recall one thing that our uh, publisher and his son were uh, real sticklers on no beards, no slacks on women. On women. Oh, and and Betty. Uh, kept I, I'd say Betty let's do this you run nylons a lot on your assignments let's just start charging them on your on your what we call the white sheet yeah. your, your expense yeah. and she put down she'd run three or four or five uh, <laughs> a week <laughs> and they finally changed it. She could wear slacks. <laughs> Just she, only she could wear slacks. Then, then they changed it. Uh, back, changed the policy. Then <laughs> later on, they changed the policy, but not the beards. Oh right. God! <laughs> I fought many a battle in the front office over reporters showing up with beards. <laughs> uh, just, I guess, got a couple of questions from the '60s and '70s. So I saw somewhere that you hired the first black reporter at the. Yeah, I did. She was a young lady from. Uh, Kansas City, uh -huh. uh, and she she was not not the brightest in the world, but I, you know, I I, I didn't I didn't go and say, hey, find me a you know what. Yeah. Uh, what. What year was this? Do you remember? I'd I'd like to say it was seventy, mm -hmm. seventy one. So the newspaper had not had a black reporter before. Had not had a black person. Really? Except for the old Mr. Jules chauffeur hmm. back in the teens or yeah. 20s. Yeah. Uh, no, no black person. Hmm. Uh, well, you can imagine what the publisher's son thought about that. Uh -huh. And... Uh, uh, Young lady was, I'd say, a, she was a graduate of UM, I think UMKC at the time. Yeah. I believe. Yeah, uh, it used to be called, uh, what do they call it? Kansas City University, I think. And then at some point it became part of the University of Missouri system. Yeah. Don't know when that was. In, anyway, um, she was, you know, she was a general assignment reporter and. Yeah. She was quite religious, clean cut, mm -hmm. gave nobody any problems. She got embarrassed at uh, one of the Protestant churches she went to when they asked her to stand and says, we're happy to have you, your kind here, or mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. She got offered double the pay at the Des Moines mm -hmm. Register. Mm -hmm. What? Well, which was still not a whole lot of money. Yeah. But she so she went, went up to Iowa. And I said, hey, I, more power to you. Yeah. But they, they didn't hire for her, her reporting talent or anything like that. They were checkerboarding too. Just, mm -hmm. And I guess I was up here, but I wanted to, and I wanted to show those bastards in front office that I could. Yeah. Did you get any pushback for doing that? Uh... No, not really. Uh -uh. Not not that I'm aware of. It never reached me anyway, except, you know, some remarks made. Uh, yeah. that, uh, uh, and then, uh, was it in 73 that the news leader was sold to Gannett? No, it was later than that. Uh, well, that was the first offer. That was the first, first runway, offer. First and that, that gave us, and, and I was... <clears throat> I, I had met a lot of the Gannett people, including John Quinn, who was the uh, the news executive yeah. and a hell of a guy. He really was. Not like the business people on the Gannett side. Yeah. Uh, uh, like Big Al, who wrote the book 
Confessions of an SOB, and I said it's the most appropriately titled book I've ever read. <laughs> <laughs> New Earth. <laughs> I, uh, no, it, I, I thought that, uh, like some of our reporters, uh, that uh, the streets are going to be paved with gold with Gannett, and mm -hmm. we could do all this stuff. Mm -hmm. You saw it was a good thing, good prospect? Yeah, I did. I really did. I really favored it. Uh, then, uh, I think it was 77, 78, I'm 78 maybe, yeah. when, when it was finally. When it was actually done. Yeah. Uh, I, I was in their office when, when it was just, well, in the meantime, we talked him into uh, giving J School uh, a bunch of stock and they built a Gannett building mm -hmm. on it. Uh, the, uh, the newsroom decided to organize mm -hmm. that one summer and I, my wife was ill with cancer, and I was working, it seemed like 84 rather than 48 hours a day. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a very bitter election. Yeah. Uh, some advice I got from the business people at Gannett was uh, not only unethical, it was illegal, mm. I thought. Mm -hmm. Well, in fact, they said, promise them anything. Mm. And I said, you can't do that. The NLRB says you can't do that. We'll do it. Mm. Let, them, let them do whatever. So, uh, I think it carried uh, against uh, by only with two or three mm -hmm. votes. And I decided, hey, I didn't. I didn't want to do this, yeah. and uh, I didn't want to have to go to Rochester all the time, which I was traveling to Rochester. I was not in the news business anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it left a bad taste in my mouth, and, mm -hmm. and my wife by that time was gravely ill, and mm -hmm. so. So you got out. I, uh, I, promoted myself uh, to executive editor, and editorial page and all that. Yeah. Final. They said, well, you can go into the executive offices, and I would say two weeks in there. <laughs> the hell with that. I don't want, I'm away from, you know, everything. Yeah. So I, I came back and, and shared an office with an editorial writer. <laughs> so, but we hired a really good man. Uh, Gannett had hired him, but with my approval. And, uh, and, and he, did, he did a heck of a job. Yeah, uh, I thought, but I uh, uh, I just decided to get out. And in the meantime, uh, the president of the university and I had had some discussions. And yeah, SMS. At SMS. Yeah. So what'd you do for M SMS? I was what they called editor in residence, and I was I was going to do some lecturing around and uh -huh. maybe teach a course or two and uh -huh. and offer some advice and and the next thing I knew I was teaching two classes the first semester. <laughs> was and, this early eighties? Uh, yeah, it was eighty or eighty one. Eighty one, I guess it was. Yeah. Or eighty two? No. Yeah, eighty one. Uh huh. And uh, or eighty eighty, and by eighty two I was teaching four classes, <laughs> a semester. Yeah, that's a full load. 
I, and that's what it was all the time. Yeah. And I had full house every every class. I yeah. I thought introduction to journalism, which was a uh, I used a book from a couple of buddies of mine and him you had written <laughs> and and then uh, I taught a reporting class which was really unstructured and I was never never happy with it mm -hmm. uh, but we were working with the standard sometimes and yeah. and do you and, think the and, reporting is basically you know are people born to be reporters or is it a, is it an art is it a... What's a, what's a, well, what's you, you, I'll, I'll put it this way. Somebody said, what did you teach at SMS? And I said, I'm not sure. I offered, I offered the classes. <coughs> and th this was, uh, and print was still the, yeah. the, the, and my favorite class was the editing class. And it, I only had about 20, uh, you know, 15 to 20 students in that. And, uh, so intro, reporting, editing. And, the and then uh, Mike O'Brien, yeah. uh, I talked to him to coming on and he got caught in that three and out deal. Yeah. Uh, uh, he, uh, we added photo journalism oh. and over and he used a dark room over in the library yeah. for that. Yeah. So we added that. Uh, but it was strictly print, and I looked at it as uh, a prerequisite to going to J school. Yeah. Well, some of them, and some of them did, yeah. but mostly no. It, it, it was a, uh, I had, uh, but I enjoyed it. I really did. It yeah. was it was good for my ego too. <laughs> <laughs> Where was your office? Do you remember? I uh, I started in uh, Craig. Uh -huh. With in the English department. Well, I was always in the English department uh -huh. uh, with Bob Beckett and uh, and uh, oh well, there were three of us in one office. Then I uh, they moved us over to Pummel, and I had a corner suite right there. You know it was. <laughs> Of course, I could smoke up a storm back in there. <laughs> we had an ante room, and and that's when I thought, hey, not only were my students not using a typewriter, and I demanded a typewritten, uh, mm -hmm. so, but uh, <laughs> they weren't doing anything. So I requisitioned some used typewriters. Uh, and we set up, I think we had about, about 30 of them. Yeah. You had to have, and we should have had 50 because at least 20 of them would be down at one time, <laughs> you know, those. I bet the uh, library had a typing room at that time, didn't they? Did they have a typing room? Yeah. Where'd you go in and type? Yeah. Of course, word processing came on maybe Well, then, then I, I bought, uh. I gave them five uh, uh, word processors mm -hmm. out of my own pocket. Mm -hmm. And Gannett was supposed to give them five because it was that charity. Then Gannett decided that I was not a retiree. I said, what the hell? I get a check from, uh, it's not much, but I get a check from them every month, you know? Well. I, I don't know, so I gave up. But I, then I had to borrow money from the foundation to pay for the other five <laughs> word processors. <laughs> so we had ten word processors, uh -huh. and, and God, they were the the real elementary ones. Yeah, they yeah. sure were. Yeah. But uh, that that was our introduction to to the IT Iowa, and the early word processing. You would go to this terminal on one floor and then you'd print it off on another floor and then you have to go up there and see, you know, and you didn't know, it wasn't a WYSIWYG. It was, you know, you weren't quite sure what you were going to get. No, <laughs> no, we had the printer in the, uh, I, I talked Bob Gilmore, who was 
the the uh, he was second. He was a provost at the time. That uh, into tearing a a wall out <laughs> so we would have a lab and Good everything action. like that. And he always always hated to see me coming. But uh, we were great friends. In fact, we were in the Navy together. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and he, uh, <laughs> and we also played poker together. Well, Dale, uh, I really appreciate taking some Well, I know that we didn't get into the uh, the, the show business part much. Uh, yeah, we got some good stories uh, about uh, Elvis and Red and uh, Red. Eddie Arnold and Cy Simon. But Cy... Uh, uh, I think Cy's wife's still living. Yeah, she is. Rosie. Yeah, yeah, Rosie. Never she's, met her. She's quite a gal. She yeah. really is. Uh huh. Uh, very nice. Of course, Janie, the daughter, still lives in town. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, Cy, Cy was in there with the biggies. Yeah. And it really thrilled him when he got the that award in Nashville with the uh, uh, with uh, Wayne, what's his name, song. Yeah, Johnson. No. Woody, Woody Priest, no. Oh, uh, Wayne Carson. Wayne Carson, yeah. Wayne Carson, yeah. Yeah, we're always on my mind. Yeah. In fact, I heard Willie sing it again the other night on the, on the PBS show. Yeah. On that Willie and Waylon. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, if it weren't for PBS, I think I'd, and radio, I'd, I I don't listen to commercial radio at all anymore. I no. Can't do it. NPR. NPR. Yeah. Well, again, thanks very much. Appreciate Happy it. to. I don't know that we uh, solved any problems. <laughs> well, that's not the point. <laughs> <laughs> and what we'll do is, um, uh, I got a guy who will he'll, he'll get a good clean start to this. Go to get a good clean ending, and we'll, we'll, you won't edit it out at all. You know, you didn't use any cuss words. So. I, I don't. <laughs> and we'll just put it, we'll put it up. And uh, I haven't uh, I haven't insulted anybody in a long time, anyway. So I. <laughs> You're about <laughs> due, huh? <laughs> I. I, uh, I I don't know. As an editor, I I, I still look back on some of the things that I. I wish I would, you know, all that yeah. stuff. Yeah. And the same way with teaching. Yeah. But uh, teaching, I uh, I loved it. I really did. As I said, it was great for my ego, and yeah. and I think the kids, most of them, enjoyed it. Every now and then, I would, uh, I, you know, they used to write the critiques. Do they still do that oh, anymore? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Do Student they, feedback, yeah. The, the feedback, yeah. I, I did it for about three years and had the feedbacks and uh, and decided to hell with it. <laughs> uh, they were blowing smoke, most of them were, yeah. you know. Yeah. And, uh, and I don't They have I, websites now, Rate Your Professor, where, you know. Yeah, you I, know. you know, I, I guess maybe I didn't want to hear, well, well, you gotta take it so, with, some of it, you know. You I, gotta take it with a grain of salt. You know? Yeah, uh, I I don't know how valuable it is. Yeah, but you enjoyed it overall. Oh, teaching, yeah. yeah. And you enjoyed your newspaper, newspaper. Yeah, I did. I we learned a word today: newspapering. Newspapering, but I uh, I really don't miss it that uh, uh, no. particularly. And now, uh, no, I, I the. the even the positions on the uh, in the newsroom, <laughs> they, they don't even call them yeah. editors or reporters or anything like yeah. that anymore. I yeah, but it's it's changed. I, what do you see as the future of the uh, what do they call it the fourth estate in America? Well, I I wish I could say the two shall be one, but I, <laughs> but I don't think I I don't think that's the, certainly not currently the way. Well, I I read I still read uh, ten to twelve papers a day. I, I when I say I read them, I I look at them, 
And do you still uh, get the print editions, or do you, huh? do you get the print editions, or do you no. go online? Or, go online. Yeah. Yeah. I New York don't, Times, Washington Post. Washington Post, Post New York Post. Times, and uh, po well, I read the Post Dispatch Post uh, every every day. Yeah. Uh, because of the Cardinals being <laughs> 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 no, no, that's still a good newspaper. Yeah. I post then then I switch around. I'll I'll read the Dallas Morning News. I'll read the Atlanta Constitution, uh, the Boston Globe. The Chicago Tribune, the Chicago right. Sun Times, the right. Des Moines Register, yeah. uh, L.A. Times. You ever go to L.A. Times? Time? I sure do, and the Seattle Post Intelligencer. Yeah. Uh, so I, uh, I call those up, yeah. and I, I look at uh, the op eds, uh, now and then the editorials, but not so much. Uh, uh, probably. The two finest newspapers, in in my estimation, today, today, are uh, the Washington Post and the Times and the New York Times, mm -hmm. and they are great newspapers, mm -hmm. in my estimation. I know that they, both of them, are really taking a beating now yeah. too. Uh, but on balance, that you think they are the yes, two, I, the two I, premier I, newspapers in our nation. I think so. Uh, Every, every newspaper crosses the line now a little bit too much sometimes. They're a little over eager. Yeah. Uh, I don't, but God, they, I, I don't think if we, if we took a vote today, well, newspapers always wound up around trash collectors anyway, you know, on a, Public opinion vote. Uh, I, I I used to. I did, day one in all my classes, and I used to do it with reporters. Before that, I said, "Do you think that the press should be regulated? The press or the media mm -hmm. should be regulated." Ninety percent hands up. Really? Yeah. Okay. Who? Who regulates them? Mm -hmm. Do you have to be, as in some Latin countries, you have to go to a certain school of journalism to be approved, you know? Yeah, right. You have to be registered as a journalist. Mm -hmm. Do you have to, uh, should the government Submit stories for review before they're. Should released. the government uh, be uh, give you their approval? What government? Uh, anything like that? And I said, what do you do with the Constitution then? Then there's no answers, and I can't answer myself except I don't want any further regulation, yeah. and I don't think the people. Yeah, the people do, but they don't. They don't know how. They would love to, <laughs> but only singularly uh, do they want to do it. Yeah. So you know, I, I hell, I'm I'm the first to admit that we go too far sometimes. Yeah, but you know, I've heard I've heard a lot that uh, there's the it's almost a saying now. There's that. Ultimately, a people get the government they deserve. Do you think ultimately the people get the media that they deserve? That will what now? That you you know a people gets the government that they that's the best fit for them. Whether it's a totalitarian totalitarian regime or a representative democracy. And somehow there's a there's like a, a cosmic justice in in what happens. Do you think the same thing with media? You know, media is kind of uh, you know there's a lot of um, I can't stomach it anymore. To be honest with you, a lot of it it's non news to me. It's something else. It's not news. It's entertainment or I don't know what what it is. But well, it's very little hard news yeah. of any kind. Yeah. The uh, this banter back and forth and you know. What one thing, man, we have, we have borne the devil in uh, 
born, like give it birth born. to? Born. Born. Yeah. <laughs> like gone with the wind. Hey, yeah. born to be no baby. <laughs> uh, I think... Uh, we born the devil with media saturation? No, with the freedoms that anybody can have to become members of the media. Yeah. And that's with the internet. With you can become a blogger. Or you, you can, can become a, blog. I, I think a video, you know, we, a YouTube star. Or, you know, it's, uh, it's awful. And should we control it? Hell no, we shouldn't. <laughs> we, uh, because it's, write un it out? it's unconstitutional right. if we do. Is it to write it out? That uh, the cream will rise eventually. <laughs> uh, I've been saying that since I was six years old. <laughs> Still waiting. <laughs> <laughs> I. Or the I, market, the market will sift it out somehow. I'd like to think so, <laughs> but I, I don't know. <laughs> Hell, if if I have the answers, I wouldn't be sitting here laughing about it. <laughs> All right, let's leave it at that. Okay, no. thanks very much. No, I I think that I think we have uh, we have really born the bastard, <laughs> and we and you know it's insoluble. I I don't think there's anything we can do about it. Yeah. I, I don't know what it, Just, you can't you can't pass a law right. to keep somebody from expressing himself. Right, <laughs> and, yeah, and everybody's going to listen to you know Elvis or whoever you know. Yeah, uh, <laughs> latter day Elvises. Uh, but I decry the uh, <coughs> what, what's happening. Yeah, and I, I'm almost happy that uh, that. It, I love it. Yeah. Well, thanks again. Appreciate it. Well, as I said, I don't know that we've learned a damn thing, but uh... <laughs> I've enjoyed it. <laughs> <coughs> I see you got my book in a prominent location. You have to be a seven footer to grab it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got Laura Eagles Wilder up there. Yeah, I'm, too. Ne I'm next to Laura. I'm next to Laura Eagles Wilder. Oh, so, okay. <laughs> well, I was on that board for many, many years. They they've got a nice little museum down there. If you've ever, I, had, yeah, the new one is. Really yeah, the nice. new one. Yeah, it's nice. I mean that whole it, it's, uh, uh, I you know actually uh, certain things I think become mythic. And you know, I'm not an American studies major, or, you know, uh, but what what does it mean to become mythic? I don't quite know, but it's sort of like like pornography. Sounds good. You know it when you see it. You yeah. Know? So Elvis, I think, has become mythic. I think Laura Ingalls Wilder has become mythic. Yeah, I, that woman who was living on my least a town of you when you were growing up in, in Mansfield is now this pilgrimage that these yeah. families take to go and see where she lived and wrote. You know, and it sounds odd. My my parents were. Good friends of Rose Wilder Lane, uh, the daughter, yeah, and, yeah. and I always said that they. I always knew why Rose liked to come to our house because she could have a drink there and she could <laughs> get home. <laughs> but the I think there was an in, enduring tension, intergenerational tension there. Yeah, <laughs> but Mrs. Wilder was a lovely woman, and yeah. and uh, and Mr. Wilder, and you know. In the small town, you called everybody by a first name. Yeah. Not those two. Oh, it's always Mr. and Mrs. Yeah. She called him Manly. Almanzo, I think it was. Yeah, Almanzo is, uh, but, but that's. She uh, called him Manly. But I called him Mr. Wilder. <laughs> 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 the, uh, not very many people did. My dad did. I, I would put four gallons of gas in Mr. Wilder's Chrysler, and he and my dad would go over and play pool. Together, uh, Miss, Mrs. Wilder, we had no idea that she was doing what she was doing. Really? None. She was just a, a 
I mean, she was a good. Uh, well, she wrote a column for the yeah the Missouri Missouri uh, ruralist and, and and she the, was good with chickens. She could yeah. get chickens to lay eggs year yeah. round. Yeah, she uh, she was just a good a good farm wife. Yeah, and that's not I, that's not told, demeaning, but she was. They, they had a, a thing. A bunch of two hundred and some people from all over the nation were here in Springfield last month, and uh, I was in a panel, and I said. You know, if I would have known they were going to be famous, I would have been nicer to them. <laughs> <laughs> you were no. nice to Elvis. <laughs> yeah. No, I was nice to them. I, I was kidding, really. But we had no idea yeah. that, uh, of course, there are all kinds of stories, you know, that Rose had written the stuff. But I, I have seen, you know, that old 50-50 tablet that yeah. Mrs. Wilder wrote herself. Yeah, I have because, too. Uh, in pencil. And, and I've been on the board for many years. Yeah. Uh, that was her hand? Was, yeah. 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 But uh, she was a diamond in the rough. Yeah. Very much so. But she just, you know, like Cy Simon, you would have never known she was uh-uh. famous. Uh, while, you know, Ralph Foster and John Mahaffey were come here, as we call them. Uh, Sai was a brand come here like he would summon you you would go to him you would he would never come to you no a come here would be somebody from the outside oh oh a ferner an Iowan (laughs) (laughs) you're you're a come here (laughs) I got your book and I'm memorizing it how to speak to your (laughs) own I'm up to page three. <laughs> yeah. <that's, laughs> Almost into the B. That's it. When, when I was a single man years and years ago, a, a doctor friend of mine, we went to China, uh, spent 30 days in China, just traveling, you know, having a ball. Uh, and I... Uh, I lost my camera the first day out in Shanghai, and lost it like somebody pinched it, or uh, I had no idea. No, you know, I put gone. it down on the counter and it's gone. gone. Well, uh-huh. it, that that was history. Of, I had a ball. Doctor Jameson, my friend, he had one of these big movie cameras. <laughs> Some bitch weighed a pound, a ten pounds. I know, you know. So he comes back and he has everything developed. 12 hours of it. Wow. I I told his widow not long ago, I said, Kathleen and I are on the 10th hour now. This has been 40 <laughs> years ago, you know. <laughs> One of those home movie deals. <laughs> yeah. And some of them, some beautiful stuff. You can only yeah. take a few minutes of it at a time. <laughs> yeah. Small doses. <laughs> God. But I, I used to say, I got to see China. He did, did yeah. you know. <laughs> he was too busy making a film on it. <coughs> oh, my. All right. Okay. Well, thanks again. I okay. appreciate it.